Hold on. Did you say that again? Happy Friday. <laughs> All right. Happy Friday, everyone. How's everybody doing? Is everyone having a happy Friday? Is anyone not having a happy Friday? You're not having a happy Friday? You're having a happy Friday. Well, you better be after all that. So, All right. Um, I keep meaning to fix that highlight that I said that you needed to know the structures of, um, of the citric acid cycle intermediates, and I keep forgetting to do it. You don't have to know the structures of the citric acid cycle intermediates, but I need to fix that highlight. When I walk in here, it's the only time I think about it. So I'll do that. Um, just about to finish up the uh, considerations for the glyoxylate cycle. I was going through that a little bit hurriedly at the end of the last period, so I wanted to just say a little bit about it here, and then we'll move on. So I will remind you, first of all, that the glyoxylate cycle is a cycle that, as I say, overlays the citric acid cycle, and it's a cycle that only occurs in bacteria, yeast, and plants. It does not occur in animals. Okay. And the reason it does not occur in animals is because animals do not have these two enzymes right here, isocitrate lyase and malate synthase. We don't have those two. Okay? Now what these two enzymes allow is they allow the cell to break down isocitrate without decarboxylating it. Okay? In us, we've got isocitrate dehydrogenase that decarboxylates that and we lose a carbon. These guys, they also have isocitrate dehydrogenase, but they also have as a possibility of doing this, isocitrate lyase, so they've split off a succinate that can ultimately go up to oxaloacetate through the rest of the, the enzymes of the citric acid cycle. But that piece, that two carbon piece that's split off, can be combined with acetyl-CoA to make malate, which can also be made into oxaloacetate. So in the glyoxylate cycle, two acetyl-CoAs come in and two oxaloacetates are produced. One to regenerate the one that started, but one extra one. So in essence, what you've done is you've converted two acetyl-CoAs into one oxaloacetate. Okay? Now, we can't do that. Therefore, we can't convert acetyl-CoA in net amounts into glucose because this extra, acetyl, uh, this extra oxaloacetate can be used in gluconeogenesis to make glucose. We can't do that. If we start taking away our oxaloacetate, we stop our citric acid cycle. Yes, sir? Is succinate a product of isocitrate lyase? Or can yes. It is a product of isocitrate lyase. So this six carbon molecule is getting split into a four carbon molecule and a two carbon molecule. This one is then just going through the rest of the enzymes of the glyoxylate cycle and making oxaloacetate. Okay? Okay. Well, so what's the difference? I mean, is the only thing is the only difference the fact that we um, are not decarboxylating? Why shouldn't we do this? Well, it turns out that there are other considerations here. If you remember when we had the isocitrate dehydrogenase, when it decarboxylated, it also produced NADH, right? Okay. So if the cell had a lot of NADH, let's say a bacterial cell had a lot of NADH it might not want to do that decarboxylation. It might instead want to do this, which wouldn't produce more NADH. Okay? And then that NADH could be used to make glucose. All right? So when the cell is doing this and when it's doing the citric acid cycle is a little complicated, but you could imagine a scenario where that cell has a lot of NADH running around. This might be a very useful way for the cell to store some of its energy as glucose by going through gluconeogenesis as a result of this. As I said, we can't do that. Okay, questions about this before I move on? So yes, sir? So you said lots of NADH will favor the It could, it could, yes. Uh huh, yes. Okay, good. So there we are with that. Let's turn our attention now to the next topic, and this one's fairly straightforward. It's a structural consideration relating to lipids and membranes. All right, so I'm sure in any basic biology class you've heard almost incessantly about the fact that membranes are composed or comprised of a lipid bilayer. 
And you've seen structures of that. And it's not an overly complicated concept, even though I think your book has one figure wrong here that we'll see as we get into it. But the lipid bilayer doesn't look like this. Anybody see any problems with this? <laughs> What's that? It's completely uniform. It's inside out, right? <laughs> so the lipid bilayer, of course, uh, means it has two layers of lipids. And they're arranged so in our cells and in any cell so that the, the polar portions are pointed outwards, the nonpolar portions are pointed inwards. And who in the hell drew this figure? What drugs were they on, you know? Yeah, if you put this in oil, that's probably what would happen, right? It would look like this in oil. But in any event, in uh, the lipid bilayer of a cell that's not in oil, uh, these polar head groups are pointed on the outside. The nonpolar tails are on the inside. Because the nonpolar ends want to associate with each other, and the polar heads want to associate with water. That water will be on the outside of the cell and also on the inside of the cell. So that's why these guys are oriented the way that they're, they're, that they're, they're actually oriented. OK, so you can ignore that figure in terms of the lipid bilayer. Uh, that's an electron micrograph of a lipid bilayer, with, which I won't go into here. By the way, al almost any time we talk in this class about membranes, whether it's a cell membrane or it's an organelle membrane, we're talking about a lipid bilayer. Okay? All membranes have lipid bilayers. Now, it's important to recognize that there's more to a membrane than simply the lipid bilayer. The lipid component is a lipid bilayer. Okay? But there's other things in membranes, including proteins, including cholesterol. And I'll be saying a few words about those. Before I do that, we need to uh, say a few words about fatty acids, just in terms of general structure. Uh, fatty acids, of course, are uh, carboxylic acids that are used in the body uh, as a means of storing energy. Fats are comprised of fatty acids esterified to glycerol. Okay? And we'll see structures of those later. The fatty acid components themselves uh, can look like the guy on top, palmitate, which is what we call a saturated fatty acid. And saturated fatty acids, as their name implies, have only saturated single bonds in them. Fatty acids can also be unsaturated, meaning that they have at least one bond that is a double bond that is unsaturated. That unsaturation uh, has some, uh, some chemical effects on the fatty acid itself, one of which you can see right here. The, fa the um, uh, fatty acid uh, double bond uh, is almost always in the cis configuration, and that causes a bend in the fatty acid compared to the, linear, uh, compared to the uh, saturated fatty acid. So unsaturated fatty acids will have a bend. And as I said, unsaturated fatty acids that are produced biologically are almost all in the cis configuration. There are only rare exceptions in the trans. This introduces a um, nomenclature that we use to refer uh, to the uh, fatty acids. Okay, So uh, one, you see at this end, the uh, end called the uh, omega end. Okay. And this in, is for a numbering scheme that I will refer to uh, later. Later, this. <laughs> what did I say? A numbering scheme. Later. Later. I'm not enunciating well. I shouldn't have had that beer before class, probably. I wish I had a beer before class. Later, we'll talk about. <laughs> You know, the bad thing is, when I try to be a comedian, nobody laughs at me. You know? <laughs> I say one stupid thing, and here I am. I'm a comedian. I, sh I should remember this. Later. OK. All right. I'm sorry? <laughs> All right. You got me. All right. And the other uh, designation that we have here are alpha and beta. And so we alpha and beta these guys away from the carboxyl group. So the first carbon next to the carboxyl group is alpha. The second carbon is beta. And again, we'll come back to this nomenclature as we talk more about the uh, unsaturated and saturated fatty acids. OK. So um, one of the things you're going to see when we talk about fatty acids is their numbering scheme um, varies depending upon which end that you number from. Okay. So everybody's heard about omega-3 fatty acids, right? 
Omega-3 fatty acids, good, bad, and different. Where are they? Good. good. Why are they good? I don't know. <laughs> they said I should eat them, right? Okay. Well, they're good because they are associated with a lowering of LDL levels in the bloodstream. We'll talk about LDLs later in the, um, in the term. Okay. Now, the numbering for the omega system starts from the methyl group end. Carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three. This is an omega-3 fatty acid because it has a double bond three carbons away from the end. That's one numbering scheme. Another scheme that you will hear, you will hear about, and it happen, tends to happen more with biochemists, is the delta numbering scheme. The delta numbering scheme starts with the carboxylic acid as number one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 and we'll see how that goes in a second. So if we're talking omega, we're starting numbering from the methyl end. If we're talking delta, we're starting to number from the carboxyl end. And there's reasons for numbering from each, actually, but I won't go into those details here. Here's a table for you to memorize. See, that's supposed to be funny. Later, we'll do that, right? <laughs> All right, so you're not going to memorize this table, but there are some things in this table I think are important. There are saturated fatty acids in here. There are unsaturated fatty acids in here. I think you should certainly know what the most abundant saturated fatty acid is, and that is this guy right here, Mr. Palmitate. 16 carbons, and you can see it right there. Okay? I don't care about the systematic name. That's not a big deal as far as I'm concerned. Okay? But it has 16 carbons. It has zero double bonds. Another very important fatty acid to know is that as, as oleate or oleic acid, same thing. Okay? Oleate has 18 carbons, it has one double bond. Now with oleate we can start to see the delta numbering system coming into play. The delta numbering system, oleate is called a cis delta 9, remember we're starting numbering from the carboxyl group, cis delta 9 blah blah blah, we don't care about the rest of that, but it's a delta 9 and the reason that that 9 is important is that animals such as ourselves, mammals such as ourselves, can synthesize things up to delta 9. If we were to try to go to delta 11, our body can't synthesize a fatty acid that would have a position at carbon number 11. But our body needs fatty acids that have double bonds at position number 11. That means, therefore, that those fatty acids which we can't make, we have to have in our diet, and those are known as essential fatty acids. So essential fatty acids in mammals will be any fatty acids that have double bonds beyond position delta 9, like delta 11, delta 13, delta 15, etc. Stephanie? How can we all know about omega fatty acids not delta fatty acids? Um, well, it depends on how far you number from the end. So the, the, the general nomenclature is they start numbering from the methyl end, but that also varies with how far you are from the carboxyl. So what if you have a long fatty acid versus a short, the numbering changes. Mm -hmm. So the numbering is relative to the carboxyl for the, um, uh, for, I'm not answering your question very well. The numbering is from the carboxyl, okay, uh, for delta because that tells us whether or not it's an essential fatty acid. I can't tell from the omega if it's, if, if it's a, an essential or not. Okay? Okay. Now that I've totally confused you. Yes, sir? Did you say we, like mammals, can't? That's right. Pass, but like omega-3 comes from fish, so that's not a mammal. That's not a mammal. They, they can? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, everyone. And that's important. Uh, <laughs> that's a very, it's a very important point. So fish can do this. Fish are not mammals, and fish can make these. And as we'll see, that's important that they can make them because they need them. They need them uh, even more than we do. Okay. So there's a couple of important fatty acids. All right. Well, fatty acids, as I said, are found in fats, but fats are not part of the lipid bilayer. Okay? Instead, we have what are called phospholipids, and which things that I prefer to call glycerophospholipids, that are components of the lipid bilayer. They're related to fats. If I had a fat, I would have a glycerol backbone. I would have fatty acid, fatty acid, fatty acid. That would be what a fat is. Well, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't have a polar head if I did that. 
because fatty acid, fatty acid, fatty acid would have three nonpolar tails. It would not have any way of interacting with water. So it's for this reason we don't have fats in the lipid bilayer. Instead, the third component is a polar component. This is the polar head. The polar head in glycerophospholipids, as the name tells you, will always have a phosphate in it. Okay? So a glycerophospholipid will always have a phosphate in it. And frequently, that phosphate will be linked to something else. Okay? Frequently, it'll be linked to something else. Now, let's say for the moment it's not linked to something else. Let's say I had glycerol, fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate. If I had nothing else out here, what I would have is a molecule that we know as phosphatidic acid. P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-I-D-I-C. Phosphatidic acid is this guy without this thing on the end. If I put something onto that phosphate, I create what we call a phosphatidyl compound. That's P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-I-D-Y-L. So for example, if this were uh, serine, I would have just created phosphatidyl serine. If this were uh, choline, I would have created phosphatidyl choline. If this were ethanolamine, I create phosphatidyl ethanolamine. You can start to see the pattern, okay? So depending upon what I put onto this, or what I want this to be, determines what the name of the phosphatidyl compound actually is. Okay. There's phosphatidic acid. In another representation, you see there's fatty acid one, fatty acid two, and uh, there's the phosphate on carbon number three. Carbon number one, two, three, there's the glycerol backbone in black, fatty acids in green, phosphate in red. Yeah? How much variance do you see within a given lipid attached? Very good question. What, how much variation do we see in the fatty acids, I'm assuming you're asking me about, that uh, are in a lipid bilayer? Uh, let me answer that question in a little bit because we're going to see that the, com the, the composition of that is important for some organisms, okay? Okay. So, um, there's some things that can go on to that, phosph that, that, that alcohol position. There's a serine, there's an ethanolamine, there's a choline, there's an inositol, there's a glycerol. So if I put an inositol in there, I'd have phosphatidyl inositol. Okay? And uh, you guys actually heard about that last term. Remember PIP2? Okay? Phosphatidyl choline is important in neurotransmission, or in neural membranes, I should say, not the transmission itself, but in the neural membranes. And that's what these guys actually look like. And no, I'm not going to make you draw those structures. But you should know the general structure. I've shown you the general structure, glycerol backbone, fatty acid, fatty acid, phosphate, something else. Those general things you should know. OK. Well, in addition to phosphatidyl, um, I'm sorry, to, to glycerol phospholipids that we have in a lipid membrane, there are other lipids present also. One other major group of lipids that we find in lipid membranes are based on a molecule called sphingosine, and they're known as the sphingolipids, S-P-H-I-N-G-O lipids, all right? Now, here is a structure of one. It looks rather, I'm going to show you another structure of sphingolipids in general in just a second. But you can see that it also has a phosphate. And it also has something attached to it. In this case, this is a choline molecule that's been attached to it. Here's the rest of the sphingo molecule over here. Okay? So it bears a little bit of resemblance to the glycerol phospholipids in having, in this case, a phosphate linked to something else. But I will caution you that sphingolipids don't commonly have phosphates in them. This is, a, this is an unusual sphingolipid with a phosphate. Okay? This guy, sphingomyelin, is a very important component of neural membranes. Very, very important component of neural membranes. It's part of what we call the myelin sheath that surrounds nerve cells. Okay. Here's another sphingolipid. You can see here that there's no phosphate on here. Here's that long chain that we saw on the side. And we can see in this case that Instead of having a phosphate on here, we have a glucose or a galactose, meaning we have a sugar attached to it. Okay? 
Sphingolipids most commonly actually have sugars attached to them. Okay? If this is a simple sugar, like glucose or galactose, we refer to that sphingolipid as a cerebroside. That's what you see here. So a sphingolipid that has a simple sugar in it is called a cerebroside. If we have a more complex sugar, like maybe four or five sugar units linked out here, an oligosaccharide linked to it, if we had that, we would call it a gangliocide. You'll notice that cerebroside sounds like cerebellum of the brain. We think of gangliosides like ganglia, and in fact, these sphingolipids are common components of brain lipids, very common components of brain lipids. They're also found in other places in other cells as well. So it's not like they're exclusive to the brain, but they are more abundant in the brain. OK. Sure. Yes, I'll let you catch up. How about that? I get going, and I never know how fast I'm going. Am I going fast today? Whoa. Ever, guys, ever since you guys laughed at my Leda, I figured that I could just do anything I wanted to today. So, <laughs> What time is it? How about a joke? <laughs> OK. So how many people in here have heard my crunch bird joke? My crunch bird joke. Nobody's heard my crunch bird joke? Oh, wow. OK. Means nobody's watching my old videos, I guess, because I tell it every term. All right, so the, um, there's this lady, and her husband's birthday's coming up, okay? And she decides she's going to get her husband an unusual present for his birthday, all right? So she goes looking around, she goes looking around. Finally, she decides to go to a pet store. She walks into the pet store, and she says to the pet shop owner, she says, You know, she says, my husband's birthday is today, and I really want to get something really interesting and different for him. Pet shop owner says, I know what you need. He goes back in the back room, and he comes out, and he's got this great big iguana on a leash. Pulls it out. Okay. She looks at it and goes, wow, I don't think that's quite right. It's just, it's just, I don't want to have an iguana running around the house, right? You know, where are you going to keep the thing, right? So he goes, oh, OK. So takes it back, and he says, I know. And so he goes out, and he pulls out this this long boa constrictor and pulls it out. You know? She looks at it and says, no, I just, again, I just, I just don't think that's right for the house. Well, he throws his hands up in the air. He goes, he pulls out three or four or five exotic animals. And every one, it's the same thing. Finally, he's about to give up. And he says, ah, he says, I know what you want. You want a crunch bird. She says, what's a crunch bird? He says, watch this. He says, you see that little bird sitting over there on that perch? And there's this little tiny bird sitting over there on the perch. Okay. And uh, she says, yeah. He says, watch this. And he says, crunch bird, chair. And the bird jumps off of that perch. It flies over to this chair. And it demolishes the chair in front of her eyes. <laughs> Little tiny bird. That's really awesome. He says, oh, you haven't seen anything. Crunch bird, desk. And he points over to this even bigger desk. And in two minutes, it's sawdust. She said, this is really something different. My husband's going to love this. So she takes it home, and she got the little bird on her finger, and she walks in the door, and she says, honey, I got something for you for your birthday. She says, she says it just like that, OK? He says, what? He's reading the paper. He looks at me and says, what is it? She says, this is a crunch bird. He says, crunch bird? Crunch bird my ass. <laughs> you see that. OK. I think we just got a PG-13 rating at that point. <laughs> All right, now that I've slowed down, I can go fast again. No. All right. So glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids are not the only uh, lipids we find in membranes. OK? There is one fairly nonpolar compound we find in membranes, and it may surprise you, and it's cholesterol. And cholesterol has a structure that looks like this. 
And as you look at this, you can see that there's not a lot of different things that can associate with water. In fact, there's only one tiny component right here. You could probably imagine that this is sticking outwards, associating with water, and in fact, that's what it does. But cholesterol has some unusual properties in membranes. We don't fully understand all of them, but I'll tell you that cholesterol is a very important thing for membranes. One of the reasons that our body makes cholesterol is not to kill us, okay? Believe it or not, it makes cholesterol because our membranes need it, and I hope to show you how and why that's important in a bit, okay? I'll give you a surprising statistic. A surprising statistic is that cholesterol is very abundant in your brain, okay? The membranes of your brain really like cholesterol. They really use cholesterol a lot. In fact, if you take brain and you dry it down, which you can really do after you listen to a few of my lectures, you take brain and you dry it down, 14% of the weight of brain, of dried brain, is cholesterol. That's an astonishing amount of cholesterol. So it gives you an idea, I guess it depends on the size of your brain too though, right? So, um, but it gives you an idea about why the body is making cholesterol. It's clearly there for a reason, it's clearly there because our body needs it. What we're going to see is that cholesterol actually affects the way that a membrane is fluid or not fluid. Okay? And I'll show you that in just a moment. What do you think that is? Oh, you read the thing, but I mean that's not an Archean. That's actually a thermal vent in Yellowstone. Okay? It's a very nasty environment. I mean, that's, nasty environments like this are where we find the archaebacteria, known as the Archaeans. Okay? They are in very caustic, very hostile environments. And when we look at their membranes, we discover that they have some different properties of the lipids that they contain compared to our membranes. Okay? One is it's a lot hotter, but more importantly for our purposes is that it is actually a, an environment that is very acidic frequently. So when we look at Archaeans that live in acidic environments, what we discover is that they do not have the same bond between the uh, glycerol backbone and the fatty acids that we do. Does anybody see the difference? The difference is that we have a carboxylic acid, that is we have an ester bond here. They have ether bonds here that appears to protect these guys from getting hydrolyzed in the acidic environments in which the cells live. So Archaeans actually have a different linkage for their fatty acids to the glycerol backbone compared to other cells. Well, you begin to see now, getting back to the question that uh, was asked just a little bit earlier about how membrane composition may change as a result of the environment in which uh, lipids exist, okay? All right, let me just, actually, let me, that's a good one to make another point. I'll make this point, then I'll, then I'll get to what I was gonna say. If we look at these, we see that even though those chemical structures that we saw, for example, for the glycerophospholipids, an example on the top, or the sphingolipid, an example here, or the archaeolipids down here, all right? They all have the same general structure. They have a long nonpolar end, a long nonpolar end, a long nonpolar end, and a polar head group. So at a first approximation, they don't look that different from each other. Okay? That's an important thing because they've all got to coexist in the same environment of the lipid bilayer. We frequently shorthand these guys by showing them they have two nonpolar tails and one polar head. That is a simplification, and I'll just leave that at that. Okay, and what did I want, where is my thing I wanted to go to? Okay, so um, I'm going to jump because it's actually relevant to what I'm talking about here. I'm going to jump down to the um, phase transition, okay, under further characterization here. I'm going to this figure right here. This is relevant for the composition. Maybe I should change it on the links next time I do this lecture. But this is important for understanding the composition of lipid membranes, bi lipid bilayers, all right? What is this showing us? Well, imagine, if you will, that let's say I'm studying a fatty acid, okay? If I'm studying a fatty acid, 
I can think of some chemical properties of the fatty acid, right? The fatty acid would have a melting temperature, it would have a boiling temperature, it would have all kinds of various chemical properties associated with it. For the moment, I want to think about melting temperature. A fatty acid, if I take it, uh, is going to have a certain temperature at which it becomes solid, and when I heat it up, it's going to have a temperature at which it becomes more liquid, right? Like any other compound would have. Well, fatty acid properties in terms of their ability to be liquid versus solid are related to their uh, saturation. The more saturated they are, the higher their melting temperature. The more saturated they are, the higher their melting temperature. This is also true of the lipid bilayers that contain them. Okay? So just like as the fatty acids have a higher melting temperature when they're saturated, lipid bilayers that have more saturated fatty acids in them will have a higher, we don't call it melting temperature, we call it a transition temperature, but it's essentially the same thing, place where they become more fluid. All right? If we want something to be more fluid at a lower temperature, we have two choices. One is we can make it more unsaturated, meaning it has more fatty acids with more double bonds. Or we can shorten the length. Okay? Longer fatty acids also have higher melting temperatures. Shorter ones have lower melting temperatures. So unsaturation and shortening will lower the melting temperature of both fatty acids and the membranes that they're in. Saturation and, high and longer chains will raise the melting temperature. Now this becomes very important for organisms that live in fairly cold environments. Okay? A really good example is our fish. Is fish our fish? Okay? Because what I'm talking about singular or plural. But the point is that fish live out in the ocean where the temperature is fairly chilly. If you fall into the ocean off the Pacific coast, you've got maybe an hour, maybe less than that, to get out before you die of hypothermia. Well, if fish had that happen, they would have to have a very short life cycle. Okay? Some fish live in water where the temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not solid because there's enough salt in the water to keep that from actually freezing, but the animal has to exist there. Their membranes have to be fluid. If their membranes start to solidify, those cells will not function properly. The organism will die. So it's no surprise then as we think about omega-3 fatty acids and we think about fish oil, which is very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, that the reason that those are there is that the membranes of the fish who have those need more unsaturation to keep their membranes fluid in the temperature of the ocean in which they reside. Okay? So that unsaturation is important for keeping those fish membranes fluid. Make sense? Yes? Is that um, true conversely? Like if you're talking about like a rabbit or, or a, a tortoise that lives in the desert? Okay, is it, is it true that the, 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 high, the uh, warmer the environment is, the more saturated it will be and the longer the fatty acids? And in general, that's true, but it gets a little confusing. And one of the reasons it gets confusing is warm blooded animals like like us, for example, when I think, okay, well, Eskimos, maybe they've got really longer chain fatty acids than we do in their membranes, and they might, to a limited extent, in their skin, okay, because it's exposed to the environment, but things internal won't need that because their temperature is fairly constant below there. So it's a little bit more confusing, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some simplifications here relative to fish and so forth, but you see the, how, how that would be a consideration. Okay, other questions? Okay, so that's how the um, fluidity of the membrane is related to the composition of the things that are found in it. How am I doing on time? Okay. I, oh, actually, that was the other thing I was going to do. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, in fact, if I look at the, uh, if I go back here, I look at this transition, okay? That's, in fact, why I put this up here, so I was going to tell you about that. Um, when I put this up here, what the, this is the, it's called the TM. It's called the transition temperature. You'll probably think of it as the melting temperature, and that's fine if you want to think about it that way too. Okay? The, transition, the melting temperature or the transition temperature is halfway across the transition point. 
Down here, we're mostly solid. Up here, we're mostly liquid. So we're thinking of melting. When we melt something, we have things that transition from solid to liquid. This temperature at which this transition occurs is right here. What cholesterol does okay, is it will widen that transition temperature. Okay? So instead of having this go up and go up steeply, this will come up and it will uh, make that transition temperature longer and flatter. Okay? That appears to have some function in terms of uh, utility for the cell. I can't tell you what that function is, but it's clear that the body is regulating that so that that transition temperature is there over a longer period of time. It may give more flexibility to cells as a result of having a longer transition temperature, I, but beyond that, uh, there's not a lot that's known about that. Okay? All right. Let's go back, and thank you for reminding me to do that, too. All right. Well, let's think about the importance of a lipid bilayer. Why is it a lipid bilayer? Why don't we have lipid monolayers? All right. Well, monolayers don't make sense in a couple of ways because, first of all, we would only have one end that's polar, the other end that's nonpolar. That wouldn't do any good. And the other is if we, chem if we take something that has a tail that's nonpolar like this guy and a head that's polar here, you'll notice schematically this is different than what I showed you before for the glycerophospholipids. The glycerophospholipids and the sphingolipids I showed as having two of these tails. What you see here is what happens with a detergent. A detergent has a polar end and one tail. That's all it is. A detergent is you take a fatty acid, you put a phosphate on the end of it, and you've got a detergent. Okay? Detergents will not spontaneously form bilayers. They will not. They will form what are called micelles, which is what you see on the screen. And the reason they form micelles is because they can. Meaning that they don't have two tails sticking out here. Which what the two tails do is they cause everything to flatten out. With a single tail hanging off here, they can bunch up like this and associate with themselves in this way. Okay? So they're not forming a bilayer. My cells are, are basically balls of, um, of polar outsides and nonpolar insides. The way that detergents work to remove grease is the grease gets captured in here where it's very nonpolar. It likes this environment. It gets picked up by this micelle and solubilized. That's how soap, sol soap or detergent solubilizes grease. Okay? If we put a second tail hanging off of there, it can't any longer form a, a micelle. It's, it's, it is actually physically precluded from ha that happening. Now, the beauty of that is if you take things like glycerophospholipids and you put them in water and you shake them up, they will spontaneously form bilayers. They'll form in three dimensions all the way around, so you can imagine they're like a membrane surrounding a cell. They will spontaneously do that. That turns out to be very, very useful for delivery of certain medicines. Okay? Let me show you how we use that. Okay? Ah, uh, blah, blah. When we do this artificially, we create something called a liposome. Okay? So a liposome is something that's man-made. I've taken a bunch of glycerophospholipids, I've dumped them into water, I've shaken it up, and when I shake it up, what happens is this will spontaneously form a lipid bilayer. That lipid bilayer will form an enclosure very much like a cell would have. So if this were a cell, this would be the cytoplasm in here. This would be an exaggerated lipid bilayer out here. All right? Everybody understand that? This structure will spontaneously form if I shake it up. But why is that important? Well, you'll see why that's important in just a second. Because if I do that, let's imagine I've got a drug I want to get into cells. But the drug doesn't cross the membrane very readily. Many compounds will not cross the lipid bilayer by themselves very readily. Well, if your drug has to get into the cell to kill the cell or do something to the cell, you can't get it in, you're stuck. All right? 
Well, one of the ways that you get drugs into cells that wouldn't otherwise get into there is by using what are called liposomes. Liposomes are made very much in the way in which I just described to you. I take a, phos a, a glycerol phospholipid mixture, I put it into water, and I put the drug, or in this case, this is just an amino acid, but I put the drug into the same solution. I take and I shake it up or sonicate it, and what happens is that lipid bilayer will spontaneously form and it will encase some of those molecules of the drug inside of it. Okay? So I've created little artificial cells. These little artificial cells, when I mix them with the lipid bilayer of your cells, will fuse and deposit the contents into the cell. It's a very nice way of delivering things into cells that wouldn't otherwise get into cells. Okay? So liposomes are very powerful tools for delivering things into cells that would not otherwise get there. Shannon? Do you have a way to direct these liposomes towards certain cells? Like Good question. Do you have a way to direct this into, say, cancer cells or something like that? And that's not an easy thing to do. No. One of the problems with doing this with liposomes is it's going to go to a lot of places that you may not want it to go. You want to say, okay, I want to kill a cancer cell. What I want to do is kill a cancer cell. Well, what if I'm killing half of my regular cells in the process of doing that? So there are some tricks that people can use, but it's not as selective as you would like it to be. Yep. Yes, sir? Um, uh, that's a good question. What are some drugs that use it? And I don't know off the top of my head some that do. I know that some that I, I know of many that are done in the laboratory. Um, there's a, a class of drugs called morpholinos that are um, actually uh, they were invented here in Corvallis. They're, to function, they have to get across the lipid membrane. And for a long time, they were experimenting with using liposomes, getting them across the cell membrane. So that's one I can give you an example for. Others I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, uh, polarity measures, nah, we don't care about that. Permeability. All right, permeability of lipid bilayers is surprisingly, let me back up and say that, say that the right way. Lipid bilayers are surprisingly impermeable to most substances. Most substances do not cross the lipid bilayer very readily all by themselves. That's very important. Because the cell is protected from its environment, things can't just come in and do their thing, which is good, but it's also bad if the cell has to eat. How does the cell get nutrients? How does the cell get sugar and so forth across the membrane? Well, we can see here, this is a, re a measure of how permeable various things are across the membrane. Water turns out to be fairly surprisingly permeable. It moves readily across the lipid bilayer. The further we go to the left, the less permeable things are. And you'll notice this is a logarithmic scale. So we go just a little ways, and we start getting very, very much of a barrier of movement of things across the membrane. Here's our friend glucose. It is approximately 100,000 times less permeable across the membrane than water is. If we had to wait for glucose to make it across the membrane all by itself, we would not be here. We would starve to death. Our cells would die. So cells have to have other ways of getting things like glucose inside of them. And we'll see how that, that comes into play probably on Monday. All right. Now, as I said, this is good, this is bad. The good is we're protected from a lot of things that are out there that would want to get in, but it's bad in the sense that the cell has to make a lot of effort to get in the things that it wants in. What does the cell do? Well, the cell uses proteins in its membrane to specifically bring in or let in compounds that it wants. Real good example, blood cells have a protein in them that will open up a little hole in the membrane and it will allow only glucose in. And since your bloodstream is floating around with some glucose to begin with, it's already letting that guy in. You guys remember the gluts from last term? Okay, there's a real good example, a glucose transport protein, allowing only glucose, and they're very selective. They will not allow other things to come in. 
That's good because, again, you're maintaining some integrity of the things that the cell is actually allowing into itself and uh, at the same time getting in the nutrients and nourishment that the cell will need. Okay? We'll see a lot of examples of proteins that actually um, are selective in that sense. Another, I'm sorry? Oh, good question. So there are actually four compounds that we'll talk about in this class that readily move across lipid membranes. These guys don't, all right? Four things that do, and they're very, we're very fortunate that they do. One is water. Second is oxygen. Oxygen moves across the lipid bilayer fairly readily all by itself. Third is carbon dioxide. That's good because the carbon dioxide is a component that is um, uh, produced as a result of metabolism. We want to get that out of the cell. So getting it across the lipid bilayer is important. And the fourth component that we'll talk about that comes across fairly readily is carbon monoxide. No surprise there. It's shaped very much like oxygen and makes its way readily across the lipid bilayer. OK. Let's see. I think if there's anything else I want to tell you here. What else do I have on time? I've got a couple minutes. All right, I'm going to skip over some things. Actually, no, I won't. I won't skip over that. I'll give you, an, I'll give you another example. Um, no, I, no uh, let me think. I'm behind. Otherwise, I would just say, let's, let's call it a day. Oh, let's call it a day. Hell. <laughs> Happy Friday. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, saturated. Sure, come on up. All right. Yeah. What's up? So in there, the reason why it's saturated is that it's tightly packed with like more hydrogen bonds and they can get closer to the No, so there's no hydrogen bonds unless you have hydroxyl groups. There's no hydrogen bonds that are there. Um, why they, is it that they're able they, to pack? They tightly pack because they're flexible enough to stretch, stretch out. Okay. When you put that cis bond in there, you all of a sudden have imposed a bend in that. And I didn't show you a bend in there, but that bend actually does not allow it to flatten out. Okay. And that's, that's the difference. All right, thank okay. You. How are you doing? Still. 